so in today's lecture, I want to look at the historical context, as always, start with the historical context of, of the uh, sonnets. And uh, here in particular, it's the historical context of the Renaissance and what we early modernity uh, and what, uh, what we could call the first wave of modernity. What are some of the shifts? that are happening at this period of time that we, we call the Renaissance that ushers in this last 500 years of modernity. Um, I want to look at this incredible explosion of, uh, of Renaissance love poetry. Just well, obviously very quickly, we don't have a lot of time, but at least especially when it comes to English literature, uh, the Elizabethan uh, era, this, this is uh, probably the high point of English literature in terms of creative output and, and what, what the, let's say the quality and, the, and the, enduring, the enduring regard with which the works produced in this period are, are, are held. You know, the, uh, of course, Shakespeare, who we're gonna talk about today, a little bit later, we have Milton, not, not Elizabethan, but, but still kind of loosely within that Renaissance framework. But uh, uh, we have Christopher Marlowe when it comes to to drama, we have uh, when it comes to lyrics, so the Renaissance love poetry. We have we have Sir, Sir Philip Sidney, we have Edmund Spencer, a whole host of Christopher Marlowe again, uh, Shakespeare. We have a whole host of these uh, gigantic authors within the tradition uh, who are living and creating works around the same time, and um, and it seemed to coalesce around this. Uh, as I said, there was the dramatic output, like obviously Shakespeare's plays. We're not going to study those in this class, but uh, it's what he's best known for. But there's plays by him, Marlowe, um, uh, Middleton, others. But um, also when it comes to lyric, so shorter poems, um, and and especially the sonnet form, there was uh, quite an explosion of of activity and, and a real vogue for it, especially in the 1590s in, in England. And there, the context we need to understand what was going on there is really a little understanding of what's going on with, with courtly love tradition <clears throat> in, uh, in, in the Middle Ages, uh, Neoplatonism, um, how these English authors were responding to Francesco Petrarch, the Italian poet, and we'll look at the sonnet form. So uh, that's one of the things we'll be able to do today. Unlike the other works that we looked at, which were in translation, we'll be able to look closely at the, at the form and the poetics because we're not looking at a translation. We're looking at the words the author set down on the page. So we'll look at those very closely and, and really start what is called in, in, in literary study, close reading. Okay, so you're paying attention to every line, the structure of the line, you're paying attention to the, what, what the context of that line in relation to the pre preceding lines, paying attention to overt con content or overt message, as well as what might be a latent uh, or, or, uh, or, or a more subtle message uh, and, and so forth. So we'll, we'll pay close attention to that. We'll look at the structure of the sonnets and then we'll and that, at that point, we'll begin a couple of close readings. Well, first, we'll look at um, we'll look at one of the appropriation sonnets. We'll talk about time. When we look at time and poetry in the sonnets, we're we're looking at mostly the appropriation sonnets, and we'll take one of those and look at it. And then it, we'll talk about some of the later sonnets are addressed to this uh, what critics have later called this dark lady because she has she has what we know of what she looks like. She has dark hair. Um, so. Uh, we'll look at one of those sonnets as in, in some of the problems uh, and questions and the techniques that are used there. So I want to uh, again remind us of uh, our, our timeline of, of what we're studying and, and how it relates to, uh, to the past, a way of again spatializing, visualizing, visualizing as I said, uh, time is one of the ways we have to try to get a handle on it. Um, and for historical perspective, I know, I know myself included, we often look at Shakespeare as so distant from us, as, as somehow removed from us. But if we, again, take a historical perspective, um, uh, and I've jotted some notes there, you know, 
411 years or 412 years separate us from the sonnets uh, that were published in 1609. Uh, more times separates uh, the, the sonnets from the composition of the wanderer. So here, what that we studied last, uh, the week before reading week. Uh, also, uh, there's even more time separating the wanderer from the Aeneid. So 919 years separate those two. <clears throat> and then the time that separates the Aeneid from the Odyssey, another 731 years. So each one of those gaps is more than the gap that separates us and Shakespeare. Shakespeare's kind of a relative uh, cousin to us compared to if we look at the historical perspective. So uh, always something to keep in mind. And as I said, again, in relation to the, the theme of the course of the time in history is I, I think increasingly we're in danger of having this flattened view of history because we, uh, we're uh, exposed increasingly to, let's say, the, the, the views and texts and images of the present, of an ever, an, an ever shortening present. You know, like us kind of scrolling through a social media feed, it's almost the image of what we see is, is, is something that was on the feed, you know, uh, just four hours ago. So that's, that's the past, that's what's so, that was so four hours ago. So that, that's kind of the, the phenomenology of our experience of time now. That's the way we experience time now is, is this kind of ever shortened and flattened uh, present. Uh, and uh, if, if we get anything from the courses to think about time, and history in literature, but also the time and history of literature. So that this, that the stuff that we're studying has a very uh, a depth to it in terms of its historical setting. Again, another another kind of graphic way of representing that, and uh, and getting to the point and underlining the point that we're going to look at Shakespeare as part of a, a shift in terms of the history of ideas and this shift in terms of, of, of culture uh, that we call the Renaissance. So uh, up until now, when it comes to the history of ideas, we've been looking at works that were produced in, in, um, in the ancient uh, epoch or, or, or the Middle Ages. So in the history of ideas that could broadly be called the classical tradition, okay? So they're basically still operating within philosophical framework of the, the ancient Greek Latin authors, uh, and they, they generally accorded with a certain way of understanding truth and understanding what nature is, that nature has a, has a tail loss or, or an end, these types of things. And then there's this kind of radical break here uh, that uh, begins what we could call the first wave of modernity when it comes to the history of ideas, where, where authors are consciously breaking from the classical authors and saying, no, we don't have to be beholden to them. Uh, let's start to uh, look at the world anew, so to speak. Let's uh, not necessarily look for final causes or end or, uh, or, or a telos to these things. Let's, let's look at their, their efficient causes, their material causes, but not necessarily assume that they have a purpose, okay? That way they can be freed up for the purposes that, that we bend them to through, through kind of modern science or modern technology. So that's really one of the ways, like one of the quick ways of looking at what happens in this shift to the first wave of modernity. And uh, really, as I said, the shift to modernity, the modern revolution that, that has ushered in the last 500 years. And um, let's say anthropologically speaking, if we look at the history of humanity, this shift has, has been likened, at least in terms of its impact on human existence as being on a par with, with the agricultural revolution of, of probably around 12,000 years ago. So it wasn't it, like since then, every other quote unquote revolution, whether it's you know the invention of writing or this or that, has had very minimal impact in terms of how humans live their lives, you know, like the agricultural revolution that changed how we, we, we live and work. Um, but uh, really little changed in terms of economic output, in terms of the way we, we uh, socially organize ourselves 
until the last 500 years where we have exponential, exponential growth in terms of economic output, uh, uh, what more recently ex exponential growth in, in, in life expectancy and health outcomes and, and how, we, how we live and, and, and how we interact with technology, obviously. And, and all these shifts are a product, we could say broadly of modernity and a very an accelerating change to way in which we are shaping ourselves in the world around us. Okay, so, so a fundamental shift. And that's tied to, again, a cultural shift that we could call the Renaissance. So a rebirth of classical learning, uh, a, a shift from the Middle Ages and Shakespeare's in the, the kind of peak of that in England. Shakespeare's writing in the peak of that revolution of, of ideas and culture, okay? Um, and uh, just while we're on that, this, the way this is colored here is this for, um, as a reminder, this blue shading is for those who've taken this English 205, 2105 is it's British literature from the beginnings to 1700. It, it covers that, those epochs. And then the second part of that course covers the rest of the English literary tradition. <clears throat> okay, so let's let's delve into a bit of that historical context I was talking about, um, and uh, and as we mentioned, it's the it's this <clears throat> rebirth of of the ancient Greek and Latin authors who who well many of them let's say many authors or their texts were rediscovered uh, in this period, but also maybe many of them were already known. But it's a rebirth in terms of the study of them through humanism. So before maybe it was kind of reading Plato or Aristotle to try to, to pick out uh, arguments to defend uh, an already established church doctrine. So that's to some extent, I'm grossly oversimplifying this, but to some extent that would be the Thomas Aquinas approach to reading Aristotle is to try to read Aristotle to, to what extent it, it aligns with, with the, the kind of Christian, or Christian theology, okay? So um, the humanists try to, let's say, turn back to those Greek and Latin texts themselves and, um, and try to read them on their own merits, uh, as well as rather than what they can tell us about the truths of Christian theology, what can they tell us about how we can live our life in this world, uh, how we can arrange ourselves politically. So in Italy, uh, a lot of experiments, uh, a long history of Republican governments in, in some of the city states in Italy and turning to the classics for their political discussions and their political thought with respect to republics, for instance, and, and, and the right regime. Uh, less so, again, that not, not as it was in the Middle Ages, less, less a matter uh, than it was then of, um, of trying to look at these kind of political arguments as allegories for uh, uh, the city of God, or, or that's uh, the title of an uh, St. Augustine uh, work, Le less a matter of looking at these classical authors for uh, uh, ways in which they accord with Christian thinking about, uh, about uh, divine rule than how it can teach us how to live. So the so this rebirth of classical thinking uh, affects all areas. So uh, poetry, and I won't go through all the names here, but uh, a lot of the big names that I, I mentioned earlier, um, philosophy. So uh, a, a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of these authors, Ficino, Descartes, uh, they're they're direct products of of an exposure to these uh, classical authors, either new texts of these authors like Ficino did a lot of work to uncover and translate a lot of the works of Plato and provide commentaries on the works of Plato that had kind of you know, fallen into obscurity. Letters, broadly speaking, so rhetoric and politics. So a couple of exam examples of authors there, Erasmus, Thomas More. The visual arts, so the visual arts are again, class, inspired by classical works and classical predecessors. And of course, science, okay, so uh, Copernicus, Bacon, Galileo. So the Renaissance has this, why I like to think of it as a Janus face. So Janus face is, a, so there's a, a face looking one way and a face looking uh, another. So it comes from Rome and it's a Jan, uh, Jan, Janus is a Roman god. Like we mentioned this Janus 
for maybe we didn't mention it, but uh, the Janus, the Janus uh, gates of um, in Rome are the uh, the gates of peace, and uh, they're only uh, they're they're only closed when they're at uh, at peace. And it was um, uh, it was uh, Augustus who was able to bring peace to Rome and, and and finally closed those gates for the first time in a long time. So the Janus face. If something has a Janus face, generally speaking, if we give, use that expression about it, we, we say it can be, let's say, double-edged, that it could point one way or it could point the other. So Renaissance, it obviously has a connotation of we're looking back. We're, we're looking back to the classics to try to get inspired by them again. Maybe part of the point of departure of return, let's say, of going back, is that there has been a a, a sedimentation on the tradition that the Middle Ages uh, had maybe, let's say, accumulated um, kind of a, a covering over that tradition, and it's not evident again. We need to reveal it. So, so um, in fact, Luther talked about desedimenting the tradition, and that's I think something that that inspires uh, 20th century deconstruction and, and, and Heidegger, another uh, author who inspired the deconstruction is what he calls the destruction of the tradition is to peel away these layers to get back to the original source. So that's, that's the one side of looking back of the Renaissance. But in a sense, it's also ushering in this era of modernity that I'm talking about. So it's pointing forward. And now we have scholarly debates about, well, should we call it the Renaissance or the early modern era? So sometimes I call it the early modern era. Sometimes I call it the Renaissance, you know, but there's, there's there, there are passionate people who have passionate views about that. Um, and uh, there's this, when we think about how it's pointing forward um, and, and in what is modernity, I think we could do well if we think about these four concepts that I bolded. You know, if we think about an increasing secularism of all facets of existence, that we can think about the truth of, let's say, political life outside of some sort of divinely sanctioned, um, divinely sanctioned um, um, arrangement. Uh, the progress of science, li uh, also liberated from a theological framework. Uh, human, humanism, so the dignity and, and celebration of human life outside of divine will, and the progress of liberty and, and individual human rights, so both politically and economically, okay? So none of these things, it's not as though there was a light switch flipped, right, and that everyone said, oh boy, I guess we're living in a modern world now, right? So it, this is a gradual change to some extent, but there, but uh, in the perspective of, as I said, the history of humanity that had changed very little for 12,000 years, this is a revolution. This is a fundamental revolution. So um, uh, I just want to, obviously, it's not as though everyone all of a sudden said, I'm secular, I don't believe in God anymore. These people all still believe in God. Uh, it's not as though all of a sudden they said, okay, I'm going to take a scientific approach. There were radical debates about this, about, oh, should should we believe Galileo? Is that what's going on? You know, it, should we look in that telescope of his? I'm not so sure. Uh, and, and, and it's not as though obviously personal liberty was 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 granted to everyone immediately. And, and you know, I think when it comes to human rights and, and, and liberties and, and a concept that would come later towards the end of the enlightenment, uh, equality, obviously these are discussions and battles that are still trying to be sorted out, right? So, so all that to say, it, it, it wasn't a, a light switch of a movement. It was a radical change, uh, a change we're still living in the shadow of. Um, and in terms of trying to think about what triggered those movements, uh, I have in the, that, that blue square here, uh, kind of the list of the things we'll talk about very quickly. Um, so uh, so in, in visual arts, I switched to, to linear perspective. Okay, so perspectival painting as opposed to what we had in the Middle Ages. The fall of Constantinople, okay. The Gutenberg Bible, so the printing press. The golden age of Florence, so we'll talk very quickly about that. The voyages of discovery, the end of feudal society, Luther, Luther's Reformation, and the Copernican Revolution in, in, in science and, and cosmology. So, so we, have, we have about eight, 
eight key events that are happening in a matter of a, a hundred years or so that really fundamentally alter the way in which uh, 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 we think about the world and, and think about our place in it. So linear perspective. So uh, so before the Renaissance, so this is an example of pre-Renaissance, uh, pre pre early modern uh, attempts to represent uh, uh, a visual depiction of, of the the object of study here. So I, I picked this one. I could have picked a million others, but there's these. Uh, this is a, a typical medieval form. It's called the diptych. So you have this this kind of hinged uh, hinged uh, work. Uh, uh, painted on wood of some sort, and uh, the, the diptych form itself is also kind of mirrors the dualistic assumptions of the Middle Ages, you know, of, of the physical versus the spiritual, um, and, and um, you know, so you have on the one side here Mary and, and baby Jesus kind of representing kind of a, a, a divine goal. You have on the other side the physical, uh, you have, uh, you have, uh, uh, Saint Jerome translating the Gospel Gospel of John, and, and and so we have the literal text as opposed to the meaning. We have uh, Jerome, this this human person, uh, who's who's obviously devoted to a divine end, but this is the physical manifestation of this this person. So everything about both the form and the content mirror this notion of of, of the kind of medieval point of departure of dualism. Okay, now. Uh, the other thing I just won't want you to note, though, is the uh, there's no perspective there. If we look at the uh, the texts here that are ostensibly uh, higher up on the shelf, they don't fade away into the distance. They're just kind of slanted up like this, and uh, uh, something in the background is not necessarily small or what have you. So, so it's not something they paid attention attention to. So it's not necessarily a natural disposition to draw things as being having a foreground and a background. Okay. So, uh, you know, like when, when the earliest cave paintings didn't feel like we should have foreground background, at least that are the ones that I've seen, you know, and, and have had described to me. So, so it, it's not necessarily a natural point of departure that one would have to take when visually representing anything. You know, uh, like my, my kids, when they're drawing houses, they don't necessarily have st stuff in the foreground background. So but what happens in uh, with this character, Filippo Brunelleschi is, is, is often credited with, with first introducing this notion of linear perspective. So he uses this kind of geometrical calculation, you know, those, those uh, Kind of lines coming from the corners of the of the of the of the canvas to a vanishing point in the middle in order to determine where where things should fade off in the distance. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have his original panels in, in terms of examples of, of his method of trying to go about that. But the method spread very widely and very quickly after people saw it. They see it as well, obviously as a real realistic way in which we we kind of see things in in terms of their three dimensions. Um, the, uh, here, so here's an example of, of two works. Uh, uh, the, uh, so this is not Brunelleschi, it's Masaccio uh, on the right, um, 1424 uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the crucifixion. Um, and then another one, uh, a typical late medieval de depiction of the crucifixion with, without any perspective. So what, what it does, so before in the Middle Ages, size is determined by importance within the, within, within the subject, within the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the mise-en-scene of the different characters and the subject matter in the, in the painting. Um, and in, as we switch to perspective view, uh, linear perspective, it's privileging, let's say, the viewpoint of a viewing subject, okay? So, so what, happens is the individual viewer becomes kind of, let's say, the privileged point of view. And uh, size is not necessarily determined by the inherent worth of the object. It's by its relation, its proximity or distance to the viewer, right? So, so we have as part of this, this turn to modernity is a privileging of the individual sub subject as locus of truth. So we'll see that as 
bearing fruit in, let's say, the metaphysics of Descartes, you know, I, th I think, therefore I am, you know, what, damn the rest of the world. Um, I don't want, that sounds, uh, sounds flippant, you know, it's obviously a fundamental shift, but it's, it's part of a, it, it's part of this thinking of, about the individual subject as, as, let's say, the locus of truth, the, the site of truth, the foundation of truth. Um, we'll also see this pr privileging of the individual when it comes to the, the emphasis placed on the individual interpretation of scripture in, in the Reformation. We'll see it in terms of the uh, privileging of individual choice in early capitalism. Okay, individual economic liberties uh, become the motor of, of, of the good society, like good, a good political social arrangement is determined by these political exchanges and our, our, own, our own free, free uh, economic choices. So the next, uh, on my list, the next uh, item I wanted to quickly mention there was the fall of the Byzantine Empire, the fall of Constantinople. With, with this triggers is the migration of Byzantine scholars um, through, throughout, the, throughout the West. And, and they, they brought with them learning. They brought with them uh, uh, deeper understanding, knowledge of the classical languages and spread uh, spread the teaching of those classical languages, Latin, uh, uh, Latin was already well known, Greek, uh, Greek, Hebrew, uh, as well as the texts that they had. So uh, as a direct result of that, that enabled what, what we'll talk about a little bit later is the Florin, the golden age of Florence, where under the, uh, the patronage of the Medici, these scholars come in and, and, and go and find original texts of Plato and, and have them translated and, and, and new commentaries on them. The Gutenberg Bible, I think uh, I can't underest, I can't stress enough how important this was, you know, the, um, the, the first printing press in terms of fundamentally shifting how we live, how we live. So it's, it's probably the first, well, first of all, the first industrial, the, the, the first kind of example of industrial production. So the industrial revolution itself is is, is generally situated much later, 1760 or so, you know, steam engine, et cetera. But with the printing press, we have um, uh, you, the use of these, you know, uh, these, these little typeset keys for each letter that are arranged. And we have the repetitive uh, uh, identical reproduction of the same for the first time uh, uh, in human history, in a sense. So. So what we one one important shift is just the availability of literature, philosophy, liter. Uh, when I say literature, I mean broadly the, the availability of texts for people to read. So um, before we have to get our head around this. Okay, so this is I can never understand this. Okay, so in the Middle Ages, uh, so looking at the graph on the left. The, the European output of manuscripts. Okay, so manuscripts is means handwritten, manuscript. Okay, so from 500 to 1500. So there's a gradual increase as more and more monks got onto the job, I guess, um, of, of the ability of these monks to churn out manuscripts. So by, by the 15th century, over the course of that whole century, they were able to crank out 5 million, okay? So that's not bad, um, but what's happening here? Why does it take, what, what's going on there? So you have the most highly educated and skilled uh, labor force, the monks, right? The ones who have studied, uh, you know, they've gone through university to get their equivalent of doctorate. They're sitting away, writing on expensive, uh, uh, expensive writing substances. They don't have like cheap pulp paper like we have. We they're using vellum, you know, uh, 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 hides of animals, other 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 um, other expensive materials here. And maybe it takes them two years to write out a copy of the Bible. Let's say because they're writing it very beautifully, etc. So let's say if we take the the labor the labor value of that monk's time, the the, the actual uh, value of the materials that go into that final product, there's some estimates that this one 
text of the Bible would be worth in today's dollars, um, your house, right? The, 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 in equivalent purchasing power, so to speak. So, um, so obviously not everyone had these, right? And these texts and um, uh, it, it's, it's obviously a slow process, first of all, you know, we're not gonna have a, a lot of these just churned out for willy-nilly. So you're gonna be very careful about what you do. You're gonna say, okay, well, the Bible, give me two other books, you know, that's it, okay? That's all I've got in me for the next decade. I'm gonna do those three, okay? So, so very selective about which books could be reproduced. Uh, probably a lot of Bibles, probably a lot of commentaries on Bibles, maybe Aristotle, maybe Plato. So the diversity of what people are reading is also, is also let's say, restricted. The availability obviously is restricted, as we can tell, um, and restricted to uh, people who have the means and the education to read it. So not very many people read, you know, need to read, so you probably don't have a book. And um, um, so a, a restriction to a small set of the population, okay? So what we have in the right graph is after the printing press, an explosion of the availability of these texts. So look at, there's a different order of magnitude on the left, uh, on what we're measuring on the y-axis here, right? So the 15th century, these, this, there's an overlap here, 15th, 15th. And, and then the 16th, we're at over 200 million. So 40 times what is produced in the century before, and then it continues to climb. And, to by the 18th century, a billion texts printed. So uh, the availability and affordability of this information, so uh, the diversity of the texts, the ability of people to, to, to uh, of different uh, classes to have access to it. The other thing would be the mode of, the mode of relationship to the word, okay? So I'll talk about that maybe in this, this slide. So, um, <clears throat> uh, there's a, an excellent book that goes up to about here, I would say, uh, oops, goes up to this uh, fourth chart. It's an excellent book called The Presence of the Word by Walter Jackson Ong. So, the, so for Walter Jackson Ong, there's um, the, the communication technology, rather than just being this passive medium, helps to shape the way in which we relate to the word and our our experience of it, right, and needs to be taken into account. And so, so in the oral tradition, you know, remember we, we were talking about Homer and and how did they experience those poems? It was pre-literate culture, so they were experiencing it as an oral tradition. And their their related mode of thought is they they've got this community that's together about this spoken story that that's that's happening in this this almost ritual that's binding the community together is is a the related mode of thought is really one that's about a cosmic whole. You know, you you uh, in terms of the continuity of, of oneself with with the story that's being told and and the, the unity of that with with the cosmos as such. Then with with a culture that has writing, so a manuscript culture. Uh, so the, let's say the birth of philosophy happens to coincide with that in Greece, and we we see you know. Plato, et cetera, um, we, we have the birth of uh, the self relating to the word as something I can analyze. It's, it's in front of me. It's, you know, it's an object of study, so to speak. So, uh, so we have the, the birth of uh, the self and let's say philosophical disposition, scientific disposition. Um, and first of all, I'll note that this is the scroll, right? This is manuscript as written on a scroll. And then it wasn't till uh, it wasn't until a couple, uh, just the first couple centuries uh, uh, around the, the turn of the millennium that uh, we have this codex form, so a, a bound book like this. So uh, that seems to coincide with, with a, a medieval disposition to the self and a divine order, the dualism of the Middle Ages. And then the printing press really ushers in an era of the modern sovereign subject, the individual. Why? Well, if in the Middle Ages, we have this codex, or whether it's a codex, a scroll, or oral, in all those traditions, the self, this, the relationship of the self to the word is, the word being, let's say, the knowledge that's, that's transmitted in the, in the text, the relationship is mediated by a community. So in the Middle Ages, even though we have this book, uh, we didn't, 
it, there was not a lot of silent reading in, in the until until the modern era. Okay, it's not uh, what you had the way you studied. If you went to university, you didn't have a book, couldn't afford it. So you go to a lecture where I would read to you from my copy of Shakespeare's sonnets, and I would read them to you and then provide my comments on it. So um, uh, the 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 experience of the reading there is again a communal understanding. Okay, so if I have many texts for many people who are all readers we can have an individual relationship to the text. And people talk, oh, uh, that's a good bathtub book. I take it home and I just curl up. I wanna be alone in the bathtub or just in a big comfy chair at home by the fire. I just wanna be alone, it's my alone time. So that's a different relationship to knowledge that, be, that begins with the modern age and begins kind of, let's say a subjective turn to the way in which we can think about the truths of the world, okay? And then what we could conjecture on, well, this was Walter Jackson on wasn't around for these technologies, but maybe we can conjecture on, are we gonna change our, are we in the process of changing our relationship to the world, word, or to knowledge, to, to truth in, uh, with digital technologies, et cetera? And, and do we think about, let's say, the self in relationship to truth and knowledge as part of a network or, or, or as nodes within a network, okay? So the uh, next uh, the next issue I want to mention here is the uh, the Golden Age in Florence. So uh, Lorenzo de Medici uh, believed in using his incredible wealth that was accumulated family wealth from from their Medici bank in uh, in in patronage. So he, he spent enormous sums on on trying to promote beauty, truth, wisdom in the world, uh, and and. Uh, so he uh, he built and expanded his his grandfather's uh, Medici library, supported art you know the, the famous uh, artists that we all hear about of, of the Renaissance, uh, and supported those humanist scholars that I mentioned who went and and uncovered those Greek classics. There's of course the discovery of the New World, uh, uh, the, the, obviously Columbus, but also in some ways more importantly, Vespucci and the New World provides vast quantities of material for industrial expansion for Europe, um, but it also provides um, examples of, uh, of different, let's say, social ways of, 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 of organizing oneself, uh, of organizing societies, of thinking about the world, and, and to some extent relativizes for Europe anytime cultures come into contact with others that happened with the Greeks as well there's a certain questioning about well is this the only way maybe there are other ways so uh, so this happened of course with uh, in, in in Renaissance Europe as well famously Montaigne so Michel de Montaigne is a, a French essayist uh, writing just before Shakespeare Shakespeare read uh, his essays in, in translation probably and and refers to them in in, in uh, notably in the Tempest in uh, about again about another another new world um, and uh, their reflections on these um, uh, the peoples that are discovered in the new world and how that calls into question whether the let's say the the, the just justice of the Europeans so it, it sparks political debate within Europe uh, the end of uh, feudal society here, tougher to date this obviously, but uh, a, a gradual over a couple century shift from, from a, a feudal uh, econ economic arrangements and uh, to, to early capitalism. Um, also the decline of the importance of, of, uh, of, of, of the, the knight or the, the, the horse soldier is tied to this, you know, you don't have to be this, this member of the knighted aristocracy to, to, be, to be valuable in to fight wars for whatever ruler of that, that territory, the gunpowder really democratized warfare. So, uh, so the, the monarch's power could be, first of all, the monarch's power could be consolidated uh, more easily uh, over a, a, what would eventually become a nation state of, of territory. But also through through mercenaries and not through kind of negotiating with with mounted nobility. 
Um, Luther's 95 Theses, uh, 1517, is basically 95 points or, or propositions about the truth of, of Christian doctrine and um, did this in Wittenberg, uh, Germany and uh, Renaissance, and just a kind of a literary note uh, I, always, I always find fascinating is that is two other authors that are, uh, or not authors, two other characters are uh, supposedly uh, from or studied in Wittenberg with Dr. Faustus, Christopher Marlowe's play about the, the, the person who sold his soul to the devil and uh, Hamlet who uh, uh, thinks too much, you know, in some ways. So uh, Shakespeare and Christopher Mar Marlowe in their own way point, uh, pointing to, to Luther. Um, so what is, what is Luther all about there? So basically the Rust Reformation hinged on it's, again, we're really reducing this thing, but uh, sola fide, so only faith, okay, we're going to be justified by faith alone, not through works. So for, for Luther, that meant a demotion of the gospel, uh, not gospel, the epistle of James in the New Testament. So James says uh, uh, not only through faith, but also works, you know, kind of against what uh, it's a different emphasis than you would see just in the Pauline epistle Saint, of, of St. Paul. And so Luther saying, no, it's only through faith, emphasized, you know, uh, Romans, uh, uh, Galatians, these Pauline epistles, emphasized that aspect of um, Christian doctrine. And why? Because there had become there had grown up in, throughout the Middle Ages the, these corrupt practices and a, a web of, if not overtly corrupt, overtly corrupt in a lot of instances, questionable practices of, of selling what were called indulgences. You know, people, if they wanted to have time shaved off their, their, their sentence in purgatory in the afterlife, they could uh, purchase them from the church and what have you. So uh, others selling relics, uh, fake, fake holy relics, you know. So, all of these were ways people thought they were going to be able to buy or by doing something or by buying something, I can save my soul. And Luther's saying, no, you're not saved by any of that stuff. You're saved by your faith, your, your, your own spiritual relationship to God. And you're only going to get that through the next one, sola scriptura. Okay. Just one note on the, the what I was just talking about is Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is a great, if you just read the general prologue, for instance, of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which you've probably, maybe you've heard of that work, is a very excellent and comic uh, written, uh, written around, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact date, but around 1400, a, 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 a comic uh, depiction of some of these corrupt, um, corrupt religious practices of, of selling indulgences or fake relics that I was talking about. So it's only your spiritual relationship to the divine and your only access to that relationship is scripture. It's uh, we're only justified by, by Christ, not by human intermediaries. So not by your ecclesiastical hierarchy of church figures. Um, and so what, as I alluded to earlier, this really highlights the, the importance of the individual relationship to God or the divine. Uh, and, and it means that uh, also as I have here the last point they in the middle ages they had developed these elaborate systems of allegorical interpretations of, of the bible so those were disposed of and it was a matter of returning to the text just as the renaissance returns to the classical tradition to, tr to try to see aristotle and plato for themselves not as filtered through the medieval tradition so too does does luther want to return to the biblical texts and see them unfiltered as they were through the medieval tradition. Uh, the Copernican revolution, so replacing the geocentric notion of the cosmos, you know, geocentric is the sense we talked quickly about in Homer that, that uh, the classical notion that earth is the center of all things and the stars revolve around it um, has a kind of a neat hierarchy to it. Um, so that's replaced with, with, uh, with uh, Copernicus uh, 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 notion of uh, the revolutions of the heavenly, heavenly spheres um, and uh, these, you know, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler and Galileo, Galileo built on that and, and, and perfected that model. Um, 
and then obviously with Newton, we can understand those movements within a kind of comprehensive mathematical framework and it makes sense mathematically now. Um, so this, this here's a reminder of the geocentric uh, cosmos that uh, the, the heliocentric cosmos replaces. So, you know, replaces what had been kind of this hierarchical ordered whole. So that was the way, let's say, a classical world would think about things is that everything has a place. It's in a place. Okay, so in the modern view, there's an abstract space and things are floating through it. They're not rooted in a place or a home. <laughs> so just, just as the earth does not have a home, you know, humans in the, the cosmos don't have a home anymore. Isn't that, we're not, first of all, we're not the center and we're in this ad, floating through this abstract space. So, so in many ways, like there's this, the, um, the Copernican revolution, you know, culminating in, in Newton is this incredible, incredible production of the scientific view of how we'd be able to understand the world and describe it in a certain way. But in, in other ways, you can see the lament of someone like John, John Dunn, and I'll just, I just have this here. I won't read it and I'll let you read it on your own, but this kind of lament that, that, that he expresses here of, you know, all, all just relation has been disintegrated now and, and, uh, and uh, prince, subject, father, son are things forgot for every man alone thinks he hath got to be a phoenix. Everyone thinks that they're alone and not part of a tradition or, or kind of a relationship to one another. Uh, so he sees all that in, in the, the new philosophy that calls all in doubt and the element of fire is quite put out because the element of fire would be one of the kind of the gradations, the hierarchical gradations you'd see in that, that Ptolemaic universe. Uh, the sun is lost and the earth and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. So it, you can feel that lament of, of being in this kind of lost cosmos. So that's our, our kind of whirlwind tour of, of modernity or early modernity, the first wave of modernity. What, what, what were some of the triggers that, uh, that, that ushered in this shift, uh, this fundamental shift? So now more directly the context of, of the sonnets, we talked about courtly love and, and, and uh, Neoplatonism and Francesco Petrarch. So courtly love very quickly uh, developed in the, in the, uh, the Middle Ages, um, uh, the, the biggest source of literary material was, were the, the Arthurian legends. And uh, in these Arthurian legends, you know, you have, you have knights who are, who are going on these quests, quests for a grail, quests for truth, quests for what have you, and often in the service of some unattainable, because she's married or betrothed already, unattainable, uh, lady, quote unquote. Okay, so uh, famous, famous uh, Guinevere and, and Sir Lancelot, of course, they broke the rules and actually had an affair in some versions, and that's not good. So in the, in the 12th century in Provence, uh, the troubadours uh, are, are, are poets, uh, uh, and they, they work this material of Arthurian romance into, well, gradually into what are Kind of consider the conventions of courtly love. So the convention, remember conventions are expectations or agreements, you know. Uh, so if, if you're reading a poem that's in this love tradition, you expect something like, this is my convention of that genre, is I expect that the woman will be adored uh, and put on a pedestal, the woman in this love relationship, and she's ide idealized to the point of being almost worshipped, right? And um, because she's this unattainable object of desire uh, and the parallel, there, there's a parallel of the relationship between the poet or the, the individual man and the woman to that of vassal and lord and uh, the, the lover begs continuously to have some sort of uh, the, the, the woman to yield in some way and of course there's a paradox there that she uh, that she can't yield or she she won't be this kind of image of virtuous beauty that 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 the lover's praising. Then there'll be episodes where the lover chastises the love object for being cold as a stone, for being unyielding. And, um, and uh, the, the, I think a, a key point is the ultimate focus of the poem is, 
is less the, 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 the object. It's less about describing the beauty and, and the virtues of the, the beloved than of, of really showing the, the, the of really magnet, putting a, a, a lens on the poet or the self, okay? Um, it's kind of a demonstration of how much that lover will go through for uh, to, to achieve his, his ends there. So one product were, were these medieval romances, and then another product is lyrics, and then ultimately sonnets that we'll talk about. Um, so the other kind of one thread, so one thread is this uh, courtly love, and then the other thread is, is Neoplatonism. So I'm going to go over this part really quickly. So, um, so in Plato's philosophy, namely in the Phaedrus and the Symposium, there's this uh, kind of a redeeming discussions, discussions of the nature of beauty and love and their importance for the soul, for, for Plato. So, so normally Plato had denigrated in the Republic, he had denigrated everything of this world as being merely a copy and, and in, in time and as, you know, as, as, as a distraction from the truths of the forms. Um, so here though, he gives a certain power to love and the, uh, what we could call the ladder of love and to beauty as spurring the soul upwards to the forms, okay? Uh, and I won't go through it all there, it's on the slide and, and we have Kind of a renaissance example of i won't go i won't read this but in the next two slides this is from the courtier by uh, uh, uh castiglione uh of, of one of the characters in that dialogue really citing the the platonic ladder of love theory now this ladder of love is translated to the relationship to the woman right so the woman is beauty it, it was beautiful that reminds the lover of uh so this Physical attraction, this physical beauty can remind the lover of the form of, of beauty or general beauty, universal beauty. That can remind them of the form of beauty. That can remind them of forms as such, that to truth as such. So I can climb the ladder. I can be inspired by my, my love and uh, um, my devotion to this, uh, to this love object uh, to, to virtuous, non-physical uh, uh, desire of truth. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this manifests itself in 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 authors such as as Dante in in his Vita Nuova, who, where he's worshiping Beatrice in, uh, in 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 divine in the Divine Comedy. It's just brilliant there, where he meets. Uh, Beatrice at the end of the Purgatorio and, and, and she guides him through the paradise. And then also, and importantly for the sonnets, Petrarch. So Petrarch, um, his important work there in the 14th century called Rima Sparsa, there's 30, 366 uh, poems and they're almost all concerned with his love for Laura, um, the first two thirds of her in, in life and then the last third after death. Um, and these were written in Italian and, and Laura's, so she's not really a character there really. She, I think she only, she, she, she speaks re rarely. And um, she, her name becomes, she becomes this almost abstract symbol of, of the spiritual and the poetic that, that the lover needs to attain. So Laura in, in Italian is, there's, there's a play on the word with uh, Laura as in the breeze in Italian. So the world is, is kind of literally filled with Laura through the breeze and Il Laura, Il Loro, the laurel, the laurel wreath that a poet uh, uh, receives if, if they are a great poet, kind of the reward for poetry. So her, uh, in, with her absence, he creates a world of laurel with a world of poetic, uh, of poetic images. Um, so he, his poems came to be seen as the, let's say, the archetype of, of, a, of a love which is infinite for a, an infinitely unattainable woman. Like she's passed away. She, she can't ever be there, but it's this infinite desire for, for that what is, which is absent. Uh, and these, this kind of Petrarchan love 
form and, and sonnet was, was, was brought over to England by first by Wyatt and Surrey early in the 16th century. So, so Shakespeare we're gonna be reading is, is, is writing a little bit later than that, but, uh, but is definitely in this tradition of Wyatt and Surrey bringing that over to England. So as I said, we wanna talk a bit about the form because we're gonna be able to read these, these poems more closely in, and be more attentive to things such as rhyme than we were with, with the other translations. Um, uh, so rhyme, we're gonna be able to pay, pay attention to, but also uh, the rhythm and meter, okay? So, uh, so poetry, uh, uh, originally, you know, the, the, the oral poets, they, they would, you know, sing the poems to the beat of a drum. So the, there's, it's a poetic, or in, in, in a kind of origin of poetic poetry, is supposed, uh, supposed to be tied to music in some way. You know, we've, we've lost the overt connection to the drum in that set, it's a, it's sense, but because they're structured lines, they're trying to make a certain rhythm and melody out of the language as opposed to prose. So prose is unstructured. We don't care about the rhythm or melody. We're just gonna read. So with a poet, they're trying to, to, to give a certain rhythm or melody. Ideally, I don't know if every poet does that, but ideally that's what a poet's trying to do. So where, do, where does that happen? So the melody is in the, in the quality of the language in the sense of the duration, the pitch of the word. So that word might have a different pitch, the way it's said, or, or that, per, that vowel sound, or, or the, the, the duration of that syllable may not just sound right for the melody that the, that the poet wants to get across. And then there's kind of a driving beat in the rhythm of the poem that comes from the, 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 the stresses in the syllables, okay? And, and we, we just describe those stresses, the rhythm, in, in, when we talk about meter and feet. So everybody who's heard anything about English literature, they say, oh, that's iambic pentameter. So that's what we're talking about here, okay? So iambic, is a, is a, an I am is a particular type of poetic foot, okay? It's a particular type of rhythm. And then the, the, the meter is the quantity, like how many, how many of those beats do you have per line, okay? Um, so yeah, I'll just look so over here to, on the right is one of Shakespeare's sonnets is, you know, you know, let me not to the, to the marriage of true mind. So there we have, have you know stressed unstressed stressed unstressed stressed uh, sorry unstressed stressed unstressed unstressed stressed stressed so that's the way these are called scanning like if you go through these words and you try to say well this one's stressed that one's not stressed not that's called scansion okay you're trying to carefully go through to remind yourself when you read it which ones you're supposed to stress or you feel that should be stressed it's not a, it's not always a science some most of the words will have a natural when you read them, they, oh, that's stressed versus this, okay? Now, um, so there's different types of feet. You don't need to memorize all these and you don't need to even memorize iambic pentameter, but it's, it, it, it's part of understanding what's going on in poetry. So, so there's a, these different types of feet. So an I am is an unstressed and a stressed. Now, um, English language lends itself to iambic because because it has a, a lot of words and word structures that are naturally iambic, naturally this, this, you know, so unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress. Okay, so not everything and not every poem is strict iambic pentameter. Like no poem that I know of, they, not any serious poem is a whole bunch of lines of strict iambic pentameter because it would sound too much like a, or it would sound too much like a, I don't know, like a whoop overly crunchy limerick, you know, that, that, that should have a joke at the end, you know, like I went down to, the, it, it would sound too nursery rhymeish or something like that. Um, so so there, there's always going to be natural variations to that, but iambic does have that preponderance in English uh, that lends itself to, to, uh, to a lot of the, 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 the kind of canonical poems that you'll see. So I'll just actually, I'll go back dactylic. <clears throat> so stressed and then two unstressed. That is the uh, general uh, rhythm, rhythmic structure of classical poetry, both Virgil and 
uh, Homer, there, for them, it was le it's less about stressed versus unstressed as long, short, short. So they have long syllables, short, short. For us, it's stressed versus unstressed. So, and these are examples of words that if you say them naturally, they, they fall into the, the, the rhythm that is mentioned here. So for dactylic, an example would be Washington. So Washington. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and like I said, a lot of words or a lot of sh strings of words will, will be iambic, like about. Right? And then the opposite, stressed, unstressed, table. Okay. Now, and then, so that's the I am part. And then people, oh, iambic pentameter, right? So that's what I know. I know iambic and I know pentameter. So what's the pentameter means? It just means that there's five of those feet. So a foot is, is uh, an unstressed and a stressed syllable if it's an iambic. And if I have five of those, so 10 syllables, then I have a pentameter line, okay? And obviously there's different possibilities there. So here's a classic example here from Sonnet 12. When I do count the clock that tells the time. So I'm exaggerating it there, no one reads it like that, but that's a classic example of an iambic pentameter line right there, okay? Um, and We'll, we'll, we'll hopefully have time to read that poem closely because it's, it's a good example of, of, of the, the content mirroring the form. So what do I mean by that? So the content or the, the message is, is about a clock telling time. So in the first eight lines, I'd say, of that sonnet, it's overly iambic. It's overly regular. In the rhythm. So it's when I do count the clock that tells the time, you know, kind of like that clock beating. Okay. So the, the form, the, 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 the metrical form, the rhythm is me mirroring the message about time marching on like a clock ticking. Okay. So here, um, still on the question of form, but in uh, in relationship to um, the uh, the structure of the um, of the stanzas, uh, so we have um, uh, on the left the Petrarchan sonnet. So the Petrarchan sonnet. Uh, so so the letters first of all are the rhyme scheme. Okay, so a the first line rhymes with the fourth line, and the third, second, and third rhyme together. So a b a a b b a. So ABBA, ABBA, another, another kind of rhyming little uh, 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 set of four. And those two together can be called the octave. So a, a set of eight, okay? Then there's a poetic turn, okay? So there's a shift in the topic, okay? And mirroring that, we have a shift in the rhyme scheme. So often for Petrarch, it's something like CDE, CDE. So you have a sespet at the end. So in, in, uh, here we have an example of the of, from a Shakespearean sonnet, and it uh, it mirrors a, of what we get in most English sonnets is the poetic turn happens before a couplet at the end, as opposed to a kind of a, a set of six at the end. So, for English sonnets, we have these three quatrains, and you can see the rhyme scheme there. I won't go go through it, but often you'll have these three quatrains. And then the poetic turn is almost a punchline at the end, and the, there's a couplet at the end that shifts the perspective. Okay, so it's important to try to, as you're reading these really closely, to go to try to find okay, what's the rhyme scheme? How's that working? Okay, is there a sh uh, what? How is the content like? What what's being said? Where is there a break in perspective? Am I meant to see a break here at the quatrain? The or or most often. We're seeing this break here at the couple. Uh, yeah, I won't. This is a, a bit about uh, Spencer's. So the structure. Um, so there's uh, for, for Shakespeare sonnets, we have uh, 154 sonnets. We have uh, the first 126 addressed to a young man, uh, 127 to 52 addressed to a dark 
lady, and then the last two are, are kind of anomalous myth-filled myth -filled sonnets. And within those broad, broad uh, sets, there are different subsets. One I mentioned already, the procreation sonnet. So we'll, for, for our theme of time, we'll probably, if you, if you want to do the sonnets for your, um, for your discussion forum, that would be a good place to start there. Um, and uh, there the issue is a, a, around the speaker imploring the young man to whom he's addressing these sonnets to get married and reproduce in order to, to perpetuate himself, his, his beauty and his virtue. And, uh, and toward the end of the section, poetry takes on the role of, uh, of making the youth eternal or eternalizing the youth. Um, there's a triangle set of sonnets, 40 to 42, where the, the youth has stolen the poet's mistress, and maybe the mistress is the dark lady that we, we have as, as the uh, audience in, uh, in the last sonnets. Uh, 71 to 74 on the poet's mortality. Uh, there's a rival poet in 7886 uh, on public displays, on infidelity, etc. So, uh, so the question again of these, uh, the procreation sonnets, um, uh, we're faced with the problem of time. So we have this beautiful young man who the poet wants to somehow be preserved, the, the virtue, the beauty of the young man preserved, endure, have an enduring meaning. But how do we do that? So, uh, so since time immemorial, pro procreation has, has been seen as, as one avenue and, uh, and it revolves in some sense of perpetuation of oneself in terms of a replic you know, the replication of your DNA in some sense. Um, and it's, uh, it's this, uh, this is the first kind of solution that's come up with in the procreation sonnets. But as I said, we kind of, as they move on, it moves away from seeing that as a complete solution. Okay, so at first it's seen as, as a, a great way to have an image, a copy. Um, um, and then it's seen as, or at, at, in, in Sonnet 12, it starts to have illusions of me, merely being something that animals do. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, uh, it, it's just something um, that kind of you can do through, through animal husbandry. So save breed, you know, to braid the, he takes the hints uh, is, is the last line of that song. Um, so so uh, I won't read the whole sonnet because we'll go to, to sonnet 12, but first sonnet right off the bat from the procreation sonnets. From fairest creatures we desire increase that thereby, thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as the riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. Okay, so what's happening here? So first, if we were to begin to analyze, to scan the poem, we would say, okay, increase, die, decease, memory, close. So it's a, a it, there's, depending on pronunciation, die and memory, 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 uh, would, we have a A, B, A, B, and so a break. So after, we'll have like a, a punctuation, colon is a strong punctuation, a period, semicolon, will be a strong punctuation to mark a break. A comma is less strong, so it's not marking off a break of a quatrain. But thou, so this, the but is marking also a change. We're going from one quatrain to another. So the, we're going from the one quatrain to another in terms of the rhyme scheme, the punctuation, and the message, the but. But thou contracted to thine own bright eyes. Okay, so, so, um, all the world does this from fairest creatures, all creatures of the world, whether it's a flower, uh, you know, beauty's rose, uh, other animals, we desire that they increase, that they propagate uh, so that, um, uh, they're, that uh, the riper, the younger, uh, uh, if as, the, as by time they decease, their heir will bear his memory, okay? So that seems to be a universal law, but thou are kind contracted to your own bright eyes. You're being selfish in saying, no, I don't want to make the sacrifices needed 
to, to be a husband and a dad or whatever, you know, because I'm too selfish. But in that selfishness, <clears throat> it's actually, that selfishness is, is, is kind of misplaced because in, in a longer view, it, it's actually hurting the, um, the, uh, the love object. So, uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, it introduces us to this notion of time as a devourer. Time is the enemy that needs to be somehow battled. You know, and we need to find a solution to the problem of time. Um, <clears throat> the solutions to the problem of time posed by temporality are, 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 are you know, are a lot of images, you know, of time scythe uh, uh, throughout the poem, of, of time cutting down the wheat, etc. And procreation is the first solution, uh, but procreation itself is conceived in different ways. Perhaps it's one's memory that's preserved. Like what, what in the child? So we know what about the, the parent is preserved in the child. So there's kind of, let's say maybe a physical resemblance. Is it memory that is preserved? Like others will be able to recall the, the parent when seeing the child. Um, what, and the same with art. Okay, so art becomes that which replaces uh, the having of children and this this notion of having just a physical likeness is uh is also the issue there i'm going to show uh share the different screen now just so that we have sonnet 12 at hand okay so sonnet 12 here um so i'm going to read this so what I want you to keep in mind are a, a number of things. I want you to keep in mind what we already started to talk about is this, uh, the connection between uh, the, the form and the, the content, the form of the message. I want you to keep in mind uh, the notion of, of time as, as this clock that's ticking and what are we gonna do to, about it? Procreation as the first um, answer but towards the end of this sonnet, is it such a great answer? Uh, or uh, do we have subtle allusions to its limits? When I do count the clock that tells the time and see the brave day sunk in hideous night, when I behold the violet past prime and sable curls all silvered, old, silvered o'er with white, when lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, borne on the bier with white and bristly beard, then of thy beauty do I question make, that thou among the wastes of time must go, since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake and die as fast as they see others grow. And nothing against time's scythe can make defense, save greed to brave him when he takes thee hence. So, um, so first of all, just uh, kind of just, I'll just kind of generally summarize, I'll paraphrase what's going on because sometimes people, I know the language is a barrier to some people. Try not to let the language be a barrier. Try to just kind of go past the word if there's single words that don't make sense. So when I count the clock, when I'm looking at the clock that's telling the time and, and, and see that the brave day, like the day is, 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 is now sunk in, into night, and, and when I when I see uh, violets outside their prime, they're not blooming anymore. And when I see uh, sable curls, silver, so sable dark hair, all silvered over with white, and lofty trees, so uh, barren of their leaves in the fall, you know, so the trees that were were so uh, were so full before. Uh, which you know, used to, from heat, did canopy the herd. So before they had leaves that sheltered uh, the herd. And summer's green is all girded up in sheaves when it's been harvested in, into uh, to, uh, sheaves or, or bales of, of hay or bales of whatever. Born on the beer as a wagon with white and bristly beard. Then, so this is line nine, okay? So look at the when, 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 and 
then. Okay, so break. Okay, so when this happens, when that happens, and when that happens, and when that happens, then of thy beauty do you question it. So we're going to have a turn. We're not going to still just talk about things in nature. We're going to talk about you. So then of thy beauty, I do question make. So then I start to think about you and that you among the wastes of time, that the things that time destroys, you will also be one of them. Since sweets and beauties, since all those beauties themselves forsake and die, since they all die as fast as, 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 as others grow uh, and nothing against time scythe. So nothing can defend you against the scythe of time. So scythe is those things you see those uh, old time, you know, got the handles like this and, and Im Im images of death will have, have the scythe, you know, the hooded, the black hooded death. Um, so time side, nothing against time side that cuts down all these things can make defense, save breed to brave him when he takes the hint. So, uh, so I think, as I said uh, before, the image of what was seen as one's copy could be seen as, you know, that the child is a copy in, a, in the platonic sense of a copy that somehow revealing an essence, a truth, uh, revealing the essence of its origin to some extent. Maybe, you know, it's not the full essence, but it can recall the original, okay? But if it's merely a physical copy, then there's something else going on. If it's merely a repetition, uh, then it's not necessarily copying the essence of the original, it's, it's merely a material replication, okay? So here, breed, the language of breed as opposed to thine image, thy, thy you know, in, uh, you know, before it was, you know, your mother, in, when she looks in, in you, sees herself like in a glass, like in a mirror, like it's that mid image uh, uh, that's copying one's essence. Here, it's um, the, a physical reproduction that you would see in breeding or animal husbandry. So it's something that animals do. Are they really looking at trying to preserve the soul of someone? Are they hoping to see in their children the virtues, you know, that uh, uh, that the parent had. No, they're right. They're trying to breed and select for physical attributes only, right? Like it's really reduced to physical reproduction at that point. So, so I think at this poem, what we see is a turning point to. Um, I'll go back to the to the deck now. Um, what we see is a turning to uh, seeing seeing the limits of the solution that had been presented before, which will open up what we'll see in uh, really Sonnet 18. We won't go through it. It's there. It's, it's on the slide. I encourage you to read it. It's, it's sometimes seen as maybe the, the single best sonnet of the best book of poems in, in English. So some people read it at weddings and all these kinds of things. So, uh, so, uh, so do read it, but uh, this is kind of this glorious celebration of art as a new solution for um, for uh, for kind of preserving oneself in time. Okay, um, so art brings forth the ideal of which the beauty of the youth is a physical fleeting manifestation. So here it's not as though like we don't know anything really about what the young man looks like, but but the poet saying here, I won't. I won't read the, the whole so, so sonnet, but the last few lines, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. So again, to the question about, well, well in what way is the, the solution somehow copying the original? So we talked about in what way is a kid a replication of a copy of the adult and in some way preserving the adult. Well, are they preserving the essence of the adult, their virtues, their soul, which is, as I said, which is seems to be the first hint in the first few sonnets. And then by sonnet 12 is, or is it maybe just, it's just some genes, it's just some physical replication. So maybe there's limits to that. So too, we need to ask ourselves in what way does art or poetry replicate this individual? The young man. We have no idea what the young man looks like, or we don't have a description of what this person's virtues are even really. We don't have a description of 
of what is really uh, what what needs to be preserved in this in this person. Um, so it's it's not as though in the poems we're seeing Shakespeare trying to see that say that this is it's a painting a description of the youth through comparisons either. Like he's trying to eschew normal comparisons, conventional comparisons. So um, like for Sonnet 18, you know, for instance, it begins with, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? You know, so the answer is no, like a, the implied answer is no. This summer, the next line, summer, summer hath, uh, where is summer hath too short a date or was it? To, okay, now I said I wouldn't read it, but. Lost it. Shall I compare these to a summer day? Right. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So, summer is. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? No. It has. It's summer's lease hath all too short a date. Of course. No. It's the comparison is not going to work. Okay. So, so the normal tricks of poetry, or art, so visual art, you could try to paint a Mona Lisa. You could try to give a physical outline to the beauty uh, of the individual. Um, maybe you could try to echo, you could try to get a hint of the virtue of that person through visual art as well. In the poetry, maybe you do these conventional comparisons to say, you know, you're as beautiful as a rose, you're as, you're as beautiful as a summer's day, your, your virtue is as bright as this, you know, so this is, you know, the stock and trade of poetry, but here it's a shoot in the sonnets, you know, these conventional comparisons are not going to work. Um, uh, so, and throughout, I've given some other examples where these traditional comparisons are, are thrown out, like, so sonnet 130, I really, if, if you're interested in that, really do urge you to look at 130, where uh, maybe I'll just try to pull out the last lines of that. So, there's a long list of these conventional, conventional comparisons that the poet says, no, we won't, no, it's not that. Uh, like, so the first line is, my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. So maybe other poets would say, oh, my mistress eyes are just like the sun, they're so bright. And, no, it's not like that. Uh, and then the last two lines, so we go through those series of comparisons and yet, so remember the last two lines are the turn in this case. It's because there's this, 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 it's not that, it's not that, it's not. And yet, by heaven, I think my love is rare as any she belied by false compare. So, um, so I'm not, even though my beloved is, this is the dark lady he's talking about, right? Not the youth. Um, even though my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. And even though she's human, and I'm, I'm not going to pretend that she's some goddess that walks off the ground. No, she walks on the ground. You know, I'm not going to pretend that. Yet, she is at, beyond any beauty that's belied by false compare, okay, by false comparison, okay? So where does that leave us in this question of what's being preserved of the youth? So it's not through these false conventional comparisons. Uh, especially with the dark lady, we get the real representation of a human being for, in, in human situations, maybe like the threat of, 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 of a, a kind of a rival poet, threat of another lover. So what we see are kind of dynamics in a way. We see the lover and the, the, the beloved, you know, moving from moments of, of, of love and desire to hatred, et cetera. So what's preserved are what seems to be ways of recalling images of love that could be seen as universal so that people who are reading them are able to relate, able to kind of sort them in relationship to their own lives or, or maybe shed a new way of looking at their own love relationships and it's in this kind of reliving of that through the readers of future times that the that the youth, the dark lady, will be preserved. It's not through their physical attributes. It's not through poetic comparisons that are unrealistic. It's about kind of human situations and dynamics with the with the speaker poet. Okay. So with that, I want to I want to close. 